Good morning. You doing well? Good deal. It's good to see you all here this morning. Good to just enjoy a little time of worship and uh, see all your smiling faces. Uh, before we jump into the Word this morning, I want to give us an opportunity. We've uh, made contact with a church over in the North Carolina, South Carolina area. We have family in the church that has a connection over there in another church, uh, Life Point Church. And they're trying to meet the needs of a lot of the flood victims. Uh, as you can imagine, there's just total devastation for uh, many people. I was reading somewhere that, you know, because it was in the mountainous area, a lot of those guys don't buy flood insurance. So it was like absolute devastation. And so... There's a lot of great need there. I know the church is, is collecting water and just the, 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 the bare essential stuff. But one of the requests that was made to their church over there was, I mean, we just need blankets. And, and so what I want to do is give us the opportunity, if you're in a position, you got some blankets you'd like to donate, or you want to go buy some blankets to donate this week, uh, Friday, uh, Dave Rimple's going to load up a vehicle with a skid loader, go help with the cleanup uh, efforts over there, but he's also going to haul over there some blankets to take to this church so that they can hand them out to the people who need them. And so it's an opportunity for us to just be the hands on the feet, to be a part of something, to minister to other people. And I would say in addition to that, and most importantly, let's continue to pray for uh, them as they try to figure things out and uh, try to rebuild their lives. What an absolute devastation over there. But we trust God. We know God's in control. Amen? All right. So Colossians chapter 4, uh, David, had you turn there. Today we will finish up this series that we've been camped out for a while in, the, in, the, in this little letter to Colossians um, called Rooted in Christ. And the idea is that our lives are, are founded in Christ, that our lives are like roots on a tree go down into Christ and we're built up on him. And that's just a picture of stability and strength. And you know, in a world that's crazy, it just gives us this stability being rooted and built up in Christ. And so it's been the theme of this whole letter. And we've just kind of walked through it over the past several weeks. And I've enjoyed it. My, my uh, Bible looks like a war zone with ink and markers and stuff. I'm pretty bad at taking notes. But when I do, no one else can understand what I've done. Um, and I probably won't even the next time I look at my Bible, like, what was I thinking? But that's been fun to dig into God's word. Um, and so what we talked about is this letter was written by the Apostle Paul while he is in jail, one of the several prison letters that he wrote. And he writes it to a church at Colossae who, um, they're believers in Christ, but Paul didn't plant the church. He didn't know these people specifically. He'd never been to that town, uh, but someone did, and hear, they heard the gospel, and the church was born. So Paul writes a letter encouraging them in their faith, but he's also addressing some heresy that had crept into the church. A few weeks ago, we talked about avoiding these religious pitfalls. And so Paul was telling them, hey, be careful with these religious pitfalls because everything you need to be made right with God is found in the person, the work of Jesus Christ, Christ and Christ alone. Amen? So he builds this huge foundation doctrinally in chapters 1 and 2 of who Christ is and what Christ has accomplished. And there is no need for anything extra in addition to that, that Jesus is everything. He's supreme in all things. In fact, our lives are complete in Christ. Do you know that when you place your faith in the gospel, your lives are complete in Christ Jesus? There's nothing lacking. You've got everything you need if you've got Jesus. And so that's where he was at in chapters 1 and 2. And then in chapter 3, as Paul normally does, he transitions to practical teaching. Okay, now what does this mean for us? He begins to unpack that in chapters 3 and 4. And he talks about the new person that we are in Christ. You got to know this, that before Christ, you, you, you had one nature, and you can control those things, but when you place your faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Bible says the old is gone, the new has come. You're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen? And so with the new comes a new attitude, new thoughts, new actions. I mean, everything. And here's my conviction. When we place our faith in the gospel, it should have an impact in our lives. There are many people who, like, you know, you may not see a lot of fruit, and I'm not judging that because I think that everybody's at their own pace, but I just feel like something that powerful as the gospel of Jesus Christ comes into our lives, it's going to have an impact, it's going to have an effect on our lives, right? Right? All right, you can talk back in church, it's okay. So Paul, Paul hits on this stuff, and he says, hey, get rid of the old man. These are the way you used to live before Christ, but now you're on the inside. You're a part of the family, and so your life's going to look different than it did before. So you put on your new nature. He says, put on tender-hearted mercies. Put on kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. These are the things that we as believers should clothe ourselves in. And then he says, on top of all that, you need to clothe yourselves with love. Like to wrap it all together, it binds us together in perfect harmony. And then he says, whatever you do, say that, whatever you do. 
Right, so our actions, whatever you do, whatever you say, he says, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus. So he's like, your life has changed. There's the new man in Christ, and your life is being transformed. It's being changed. And so last week we talked about what does that look like in action? What does our faith in action look like? When you get saved, I mean, it just works through your life, and it's like, I need a practical example of what my faith in Christ looks like in the context of, let's say, home. So Paul hits on that. He talks about the relationship between a husband and a wife. He talks about this mutual submission that they have for one another. He talks about for the wives, it means submitting to the husband as unto the Lord. And it's not a a demeaning thing. He's just like God has this this order of authority. He's like that's the proper order and you willingly do that. The husband loves you like Christ loved the church. It's not this fickle, temporal, you know, love that says like if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. But it's a, a sacrificial love. Husbands, you should love your wives that way. And then he transitions to the kids. Hey, here's what it looks like as it relates to parents and kids. Like kids, obey your parents because this pleases the Lord. And he says parents don't exasperate or fathers don't exasperate your children. Don't push them to the limit where you're just always berating them, always ragging on them and discourage them. He talks about what does this faith in action look like? How many of you know it should impact our homes? The gospel. Of all places, it should have the biggest impact in our home. And then he transitions to the work environment, like servants and masters. He's like, if you're a servant, work as though you're not working for the man in the flesh, but that you're working for God. How many know that would radically change our workplaces today if every one of us adopted that attitude? You're like, I have a hard time working for that guy. He's a jerk. Like, quit looking at him. Look at your father in heaven and say, I'm doing this as a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I do it, I'm able to submit to that moron because I have a father in heaven that told me to do it, right? You're not going, I'm doing it for the, for the Lord Jesus Christ. What a testimony that is in the workplace. Masters, he says, remember, you also have a master, so treat these guys with respect, take care of them, and all that stuff. That was last week. And so today as we continue in that, what does this faith in action at home, at work, and beyond look like? Paul's going to go a little deeper, and he's going to look at these five verses is what we're going to cover today. We're not going to finish the entire chapter because he gets into some stuff that I honestly don't feel like are relevant to us. It's just personal greetings and instructions. But we'll look at five verses today, and we're going to look at the, the private preparation and the public application. We'll break it down into two categories. But Paul then says, all right, listen, your faith that you have in the gospel, um, it's going to have its, its place in the home and in the workplace, but on a private setting, he, he said it's going to have an impact there. And he speaks kind of on the, the speech of the Christian. Um, so the words that we, we speak. And so um, I'll just tell you up front, this is not one of those sermons that will pump you up. But here's my conviction. If we will take the truths that are laid out in the scripture and apply them in our lives, that will pump you up. And that matters more than a, a feel-good sermon. Amen? All right, so if you're with me and you're ready, tell me you're ready. We're going to go. All right. So chapter 4. Paul's speaking, and he's wrapping up his letter, and he says in verse 2, read with me, Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I'm here in chains. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Verse 5, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I know that we're just looking at a very small section of scripture today, but I pray that you would give us a hyper focus. Lord, a spiritual focus to to look deeply, not at others around us or people that we think should have been here, but at our own lives. And, And open up our hearts to what you might want to speak to us today. Lord, that we would receive these truths and we would benefit from applying these truths in our lives today. I humbly ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When you consider the subject of prayer, it's one of those that we all agree that prayer is important. Amen? We're told to pray and we're to pray always and we, we understand that prayer is important. But if you were to sit down and just be honest with each other, how many of you would say, I could probably crank it up a little bit in my prayer life? I don't pray as much as I should. I don't pray as long as I should. I struggle in prayer because sometimes I pray, I feel like my prayers are hitting the ceiling. Sometimes I wonder if God is just too busy to acknowledge my existence. And so if we're just being honest and frank with each other, prayer is something we understand is excruciatingly important, but we don't always apply it. We don't always do it as good as we we should. And, And I'm not just making this up. 
there's these research, these polls that were done. The Pew Research did one in 2021 that said this, 45% of Americans say that they pray daily. 45% pray daily. Um, you, you have a tragedy or a big old catastrophe like what we've seen um, in, in the Carolinas, and you got people that say they have no faith at all in God. Even in those moments, they'll begin praying. Like, we need to be praying, right? I don't know who we're praying to, but we're praying, right? And so in this deal, he said 45% of the Americans say that they pray daily. But listen to this one. In LifeWay Research Survey in 2014 says this. 65% of Protestant churchgoers reported praying five minutes or less a day. Five minutes or less a day. Growing up, this is how I was taught to pray. God is great. God is good. Let us thank you for this food. Amen. Anybody else pray that prayer? Oh, here's another one that used to freak me out. Now I lay me down to sleep. <laughs> I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Anybody grew up on that one? I got, what, 10 seconds of praying? He said, the average, 65% of Christians said, hey, I pray five minutes or less a day. Now, try building a relationship on that. Not easy, right? And so there, there's room in our faith to exercise and to put into practice more prayer. And he says more devout Christians tend to pray longer. 10% of those that were polled said that they pray for 30 minutes or longer and so I just want you to know prayer is a powerful resource that God has given us. Think about it. The creator of the universe says, I want to talk with you. I want to build a relationship with you. I want to fellowship and commune with you. Like me? Yeah, you. I'm going to give you access. You can come boldly before the throne of grace in your time of need, and you can talk to me. How cool is that? Now, guess who would want to keep us from doing that? Because there's vitality in being connected to God through prayer. It's like, this is like my lifeline. It's like air that I breathe. And so there's someone that would try to, to shipwreck that as much as he can. And it's Satan, the enemy of our souls. He would love nothing more than for us to just be busy doing stuff and miss this very important truth that I'm, I'm sharing with you today. In fact, there's this old saying that says, if Satan can't make you be bad, he'll make you be busy. Right? And there's an acronym for busy, being under Satan's yoke. And i got to admit that my life, my brain is already on before my body wakes up out of bed. I get up, and there's this thought in my, in my mind. It's like, I'm burning daylight. i got to get some stuff done. And I, I jump up and you know, throw out a token prayer, Lord, help me. That's usually because my knees hurt, my back's hurt, and I'm like, God, help me get out of bed. And I get in the truck, and, and I'm driving. God, just help me, you know, give me direction today. If we're not careful, we can just get to the point in life where prayer becomes um, more of a, I don't say a burden, but just kind of a, a second thought. Or as Corey Tinboom says, is prayer your steering wheel or your spare tire? Sadly, for many of us, many times as believers, we'll treat prayer like the spare tire. You know what that is, right? You don't pull it out of the trunk until you have a blowout. And we have a, a very difficult time in life and we hit our knees. God, I need you. It's like, oh, there you are, right? We, we treat it like a spare tire. Rather, we should treat it like a steering wheel. What does a steering wheel do? It guides us, right? It directs us. And so we're, we always have our hands on the wheel. And so prayer should be like that for the life of the believer. The reality is maybe it's not always that way. And so Paul addresses that. And he says, let me talk about your private preparation because you're going to go out and you're going to be my hands and my feet, my witnesses in this world, whatever you do, whatever you say. And you need to prepare yourself for that. Because how many of you know it's not easy in this world that we live today to be a follower of Christ? I would say it's easier here than it is in some other third world countries. We're blessed to where we're at. But, I mean, we even, even now we get up and say, I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we know that there's probably going to be some pushback in the world that we, we live. And so um, I, I can't afford not to pray is my attitude. I need it. I need this connection regularly with the the vine as jesus was saying john chapter 15 i'm the vine you're the branches apart from me you could do nothing and so please understand the significance in the need to pray and so paul immediately hits that i was uh, i heard it the other day it was like charles spurgeon i think it was an amazing speaker amazing preacher and someone approached him one time like man your sermons are always very powerful god uses them people respond what's the secret to your success what makes them so powerful and it is said that Charles Spurgeon took this person to a room um, off the side of the church and he opened the door where he would expose dozens of people that were on their knees praying as Charles Spurgeon was preaching. How I many you know that would be like taking it up a notch? 
In fact, I wonder if there'd be some people that'd be willing to say, you know what, Shane, I'd love to do that. Let me get in the room back there. I'm going to hit my knees, pray for you because you need all the help you can get, Shane. No, I'm just playing. But there's, there's power in prayer, amen? And, and so I think we understand that. And so Paul then turns to that and he says, let me talk about your private preparation. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. He doesn't say just occasionally throw one up or do it if you get time, but devote yourself to it. Proskatatero, I think is how it says, it's used seven times in uh, the, the New Testament. It's always connected with prayer. So he's saying in many different places, we need to be devoted to it. And Paul demonstrates that many times. He says, I just want you to know that you're, you're, I'm always lifting you up in my prayers. I remember you always in my prayers. I pray always for you guys. But in several different of his letters, he also implores us and the people he wrote to, like, hey, you guys need to be praying too. Pray without ceasing. Pray always Always be praying. And so the idea of being devoted to something means to attach oneself to. When you're devoted to someone, you're, you're attached to that person. To busy oneself with something. That's devoted. Somebody's devoted to their work. They're just busy themselves with something. To persevere in an activity to the point of devotion. I believe that's the, the feel here. He's like perseverance in prayer. Like staying with it when it's easy to get distracted, but saying, I, I, no, this is important to me, connecting to the vine. I need to have some quality time with my Father. I'm going to devote myself to prayer. We saw this with Jesus. It says, he, think about this, Jesus. Jesus walked on water. I didn't do that. Jesus fed the 5,000 with a happy meal. I've never done that. Jesus caused somebody that was dead to rise from the dead. He opened the eyes of the blind. Jesus was awesome, and he demonstrated for us the importance of prayer, Right? It says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places to pray. And so Jesus models it for us. Paul has modeled it for us. Two great examples to tell the church, hey, listen, this prayer thing, it's important to the vitality of your faith. Be devoted to it. Be devoted to it. So we had these examples there. Prayer is not a spiritual luxury. It is essential for growth. Prayer, as vital to one's spiritual health as breathing is to one's physical health, should be continual. Shane, I just don't have time. I'm a busy, I got so many irons in the fire. Man, I feel you because I've made those same excuses to be able to just put on the, you know, I'll get to it later. I'll get to it later. And then you retire at the evening and you get in bed and you throw up a prayer. God, I'm so tired, but would you please, you know, you're, you're sleeping. I'm too busy. I don't have time to do that. Consider what Martin Luther said about prayer. Martin Luther was a mover and a shaker. He made some amazing things happen for the body of Christ, right? Of somebody who had so much to do, so many opportunities. He says, I have so much to do that I shall spend the first three hours in prayer. What a great attitude. Like, I got so much to do today that I'm not going to be able to get it done until I spend a few hours in prayer. And here's been my personal experience. When I've had a busy schedule, I was like, you know what? Before I even try to go there, I'm going to spend some time with the Father in prayer. And it's crazy how quickly those little to-do things go on the list, go off the list. It's, quick, it's just crazy how everything just works smoothly. It feels like everything is better than if I had just jumped at it and went at it all day without first going to the Lord in prayer. So prayer is important. He says be devoted to it. Notice these two elements there. Be devoted to it with an alert mind. Say alert mind. All right, so the word alert there is the same word in the Greek used in two different places. One time is Jesus is, is towards the end of his ministry. He's in the prayer. It's a prayer at the Garden of Gethsemane. And he tells his disciples, hey, listen, I'm going to go over here and pray for a moment. You guys stand watch. Be alert. Watch out. Be on your guard. <clears throat> what happened? Jesus comes back after praying. And what are they doing? They're human, man. They're sleeping. They're like, man, I'm tired, Jesus. I, I, my heart was in the right spot, but man, I got tired. You kept us up late last night preaching, whatever it was. And I was, they're, they're asleep. And Jesus says, could you not have watched for one hour? And then he says it again, keep watch so you won't lead in, to be led into temptation. For the spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. It crops up again in First Peter 5, 8 when Peter says, hey, listen, you guys need to be careful. Be sober, be vigilant. There's that word, watch out, because we have an adversary. Do we know that, church, that we have an adversary? And it says, here's his MO. This is what he does. Your adversary, the devil, he roams around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So you need to keep your eyes open. You need to be alert. You need to be vigilant. He says, in the context of prayer, we should be vigilant in that with an alert mind. 
I think something else that's at play here is because this church has almost been shipwrecked because of all the isms, all of the heresy that was creeping up in the church. He's like, you need to be prayerful, but while you're praying, you need to have your eyes open. You need to be watchful of the junk that's around you so that you'll know what is truth, what is not truth. And so he says, devote yourselves to prayer, that it's a regular part of what we do, but do it with an alert mind. I love how... These cell phones have made our lives so much easier. (laughs) Right. That's what they sell us. I mean, it's going to make your life so much easier. And then you get it and you find out you're so tethered to technology. You know I mean? We're like glued to it. Notification. (sighs) I'm holding my eyes open with toothpicks because I'm so tired. I'm like, I got to see what's going on. Anybody else? You know what's frustrating? And and here's, here's what's crazy is I totally did it after I used this as an illustration. I'm like, I'm a total hypocrite because we all do it. Watch this. You're talking to somebody. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sure. I understand. Yeah. Anybody else ever done that? Or better yet, has anyone ever had it done to you? I want to snatch that phone out of their hand, throw it on the floor, like, give me that. Give me your attention. Right? That's not alert. And he says when it comes to prayer, we need to be alert, watchful, paying attention, Devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind. And then he says this, and this is, I think, one of the most necessary elements of prayer that is missed so many times. I think there's so much power in it, and it's spoken of many different times. He says, with a thankful heart. So listen, we're supposed to pray. We're we're supposed to be diligent in those prayers, devoted to it with an alert mind. Okay, I got that, Paul. What else? With a thankful heart. Oh, man, there you go with that Thanksgiving again. Because life's hard. I'm having a hard time being thankful today. Yeah, Paul says, tell me about it. Paul was pelted with stones and left for dead in a bar ditch on the side of the road on a mission trip. Paul was on a a ship that was in a storm and it was shipwrecked and he was casting this island and he reaches for a piece of wood, gets bit by a venomous snake. He's been imprisoned several different times. I think if anybody had an excuse, it'd be the apostle Paul to say, you know what? I'm struggling a little bit right now with thankfulness. But it's Paul who told us from prison in Philippians, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he's done. Church, I, prayer is extremely important. There's a lot of power in prayer. But let us not miss this very important point is that it needs to come with thanksgiving. Let me give you five things that thanksgiving in prayer does for us. Number one is it honors God's nature. When you're giving thanks to God, it's honoring who he is and what he does. You're like, God, you are supreme. You are sovereign. You are faithful. You're holy. You're omnipotent. You're omniscient. You just go through the attributes of God. I thank you, God, because I'm not praying to a weak God. I'm praying to the God who's got it all in his control. Amen? And so when we pray and we offer thanksgiving in that, it's like it honors God's nature because it reminds us of who he is and what he does. Another thing that it does is it aligns our perspective. There are times that we've got things going on in our lives and we can't help but focus on the negative or what's going wrong that we miss the big picture. And so for us, when we give thanks to God, like what are we thanking him for? That's a good question. What are we thanking him for? In the middle of the hardships, you know what, God, I thank you that you're still on the throne. I thank you that I've never been left alone. You said you'll never leave me, forsake me. I feel like I'm alone right now and everybody else has abandoned me, but God, I know that you're still with me. I thank you for that. I thank you that you see all this that's going on. I thank you that you're in control, that there's nothing too difficult for you. So it gives us a better perspective. It shifts the focus from our problems to God's blessing and his faithfulness. Remember the old hymn, count your blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. I was having a conversation with someone the other day, and they were talking about, you know, this week has just been a week. Bam, 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 bam. And my immediate response was, give me a win. What do you mean? Tell me something that worked this week. Oh. And they thought, well, this happened. I'm like, that's great. That's a win. Oh, and then this happened. Oh, that's awesome. That's good stuff, right? It's just perspective. Amen? Are you following me? We can so hyper-focus on the negative. (gasps) This is going on. This is crazy. I'm stressing out. It's like when we pump the brakes and we pray with a thankful heart, it's like we're saying, God, listen, even though my life is crazy right now, I'm offering you thanks because it helps me to take my focus off of the the junk that's going around me and put it on the solution to all my problems. Thirdly, it strengthens our faith. When we thank God, what are we thanking him for? His provision in the past. 
How many could say, and it's always hindsight's 2020. We don't always see it when we're going into it, but looking backwards in your life, how many could say, I have experienced God's help in the past? God, God's faithful. So when we approach him in prayer, it's like, God, I just want to make sure you know this. I, I'm really thankful for what you've done for my, my life in the past. The last time I came to you with an issue, you worked that out. God, thank you. Returning and giving him thanks. You remember the ten lepers that Jesus healed? And he says, where are the nine? Only one returned to give thanks. Thanksgiving is extremely important. And so what it does is it strengthens our faith because we know that he's been faithful in the past and it gives us confidence in our prayers going forward that God, the song that we sing regularly in this church, like I've seen you move, you move the mountains and I believe I'll see you do it again. Amen? It just strengthens our faith. God, I'm thankful to what you've done in my past and I just know, God, that you're faithful and I know that I can trust you with my future. It strengthens our faith. It cultivates joy and contentment. When we thank God, it draws our attention to his provision and goodness, helping us find joy even in the difficult circumstances. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians. Again, consider the, the person who's saying this. Paul, the apostle in jail, been through more things than you and I will ever experience because of the gospel. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18, he says, Give thanks in all, say all. All right, so give thanks in all circumstances. Listen to this. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Church, what does God want from us? I can't get any more plain than that. It is God's will for you in Christ Jesus to give thanks in all circumstances. It's like to have an attitude of gratitude to say, God, I just want to, I don't understand why, but I thank you because I know you're up to something. I thank you and I trust you that you're there. And so, it brings us this joy. Paul is the one that speaks on joy uh, a lot in the New Testament, and this is against the backdrop of being in prison. I don't know about you, but if I were in some of the things, just a part of what Paul experienced in life, I'd be like, hmm, I wouldn't be joyful, but Paul has modeled that for us. What a beautiful picture. And so it becomes from being thankful, a thankful heart. And lastly, I would say this, it invites God's presence and his power. There's something special about when we offer thanksgiving, it creates an atmosphere of worship and invites God's presence. God, I just want to thank you because you're good. God, I want to thank you because you're holy. I want to thank you because you love me. I want to thank you because you already know the solution. And it just turns our hearts upward and, and, and worship. And the Bible tells us in the Psalms that God inhabits the praises of his people. Do you want to be in the presence of God? Start with a thankful heart. God, I just worship you. And I thank you for how good and how awesome you are. There was a marquee on a church years ago. There was a power outage in the area. And they said, there will be no worship tonight due to lack of power. Someone said you could flip that around in many churches today and say there will be no power due to lack of worship. There's power in worship. Amen? When we thank him for who he is with a thankful heart, we offer our prayers, that devoted prayer with alert mind, a thankful heart. There's just power in that. So now this is all private, right? Nobody else is seeing this. This is us and God just having a conversation with him. And then in verse 3, Paul has no problem insisting that they, all, they also pray for him. And so he gives them some specific things to pray for. And this just reminds us that prayer could be and should be specific and not just always general. God, pray for all the people. Or I got this unspoken request. All right, God, I'm going to you on behalf of so-and-so. They get an unspoken request. Amen. I don't know anything. But to say, God, I just want to bring up our sisters or our brothers or whatever it is specifically. Paul says it this way. Pray for us too. Now consider, Paul's in prison. Pray for us too. If Shane's in prison, I'm saying pray for us. Get me out of here. <laughs> and every one of us in the room the same way, right? Here's what you can pray for. Whew, get me out of this place. It's crazy. Not Paul. Paul in prison. It's just almost like he loves the gospel message about Christ so much. He's like, where can I go? Where can I reach? Who can I reach with the gospel that I might not be able to get um, the way I've been doing things? He goes, All right, I'll send you to prison. Let's do it. You know, right? Paul's in prison now, chained to soldiers. You talk about a captive audience. Paul says, here's how I want you to pray for me. Pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities, that he will open the door and give us these opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That's why I'm here in chains. 
I'm here as a representative of Christ. And as long as I'm in chains, chained to somebody else, they may not want to, but they're going to hear all about my Jesus. Now, just go with me for a moment. Imagine you're the Roman soldier that's on house arrest with Paul, and you're chained to this guy. And you're like, oh, he won't shut up. He just keeps going. Right? Paul's like, captive audience. Opportunity. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. I have a feeling, though, that they might have said, hey, can I skip that shift? I want to hear the rest of the story. As Paul's telling me, he's just getting the good part, right? I want to hear more about this Jesus. And we know from uh, history that, that he led some of those who were prisoners um, to the Lord. And so he says, hey, pray for opportunities. So our private prayer should spill over in supplication to other people. And we're good at that, right? We have prayer lists. We're praying for our brothers and sisters, people sick, people going through difficult situations. So our private prayer life should spill over into supplication for other people. And he's simply saying, hey, listen, pray for me that I'll have opportunities that God will open doors that more people can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just give me the opportunity and I'll do my part. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Listen, I don't want there to be any confusion. I don't want them to be mis, uh, misinformed. But make sure that when you're praying for me to have these opportunities, that I will do it. I'll put the cookies on the lower shelf where everybody gets it. And I'll preach in a way that everybody understands clearly the gospel of Jesus Christ. That was his request. He says, hey, pray for me specifically that God would give me the opportunity. So Paul, talking about the opportunities that might come his way, praying for those opportunities in this private preparation. Now it goes outside of the private preparation or the, the prayer closet, if you will. And look at what verse 5 it says. One of my favorite words in the Greek, peripateo, live. A shame we're talking about how being in the new man affects your speech. So how is living connected with speech? Well, how many of you heard the phrase, your actions speak louder than your words? So Paul is saying, like, your, your life, your, your walk, your, your faith in Christ, your, how you live this thing is also speaking. It's also shouting what it is that you believe about your, your faith. And so it's a, a testimony. He said, so now in, in verse 5, live wisely, this wisdom that comes from God, live wisely among those who are not believers. Now, we, we, we try to live wisely amongst brothers and sisters. How are you doing? Oh, I'm just... Loving on Jesus and trying to be faithful to him and praying for his return. Amen. But when we go out of the church, how I many you know that's where the real mission field's at? And many people who are on the outside are looking at the church. They're looking at the church and they're saying, would somebody please just demonstrate what a life that is sold out to Christ truly looks like? Because all I see right now is hypocrisy. That's what most of the world's saying of the church. In fact, I talk to people all the time. I went to church once before. Why don't you go now? And something happened. Somebody did something dumb, hurtful. And so, how many know that it matters how we live our lives as far as Christ as well? Because we're a witness. We also have opportunities. Paul's praying for opportunities. We have opportunities around us in our own context. Maybe it's at work. Maybe it's in your social circles. Maybe it's just whatever, a softball game, football game, whatever. We all have these opportunities that come our way. And, and Paul says in that context, as a follower of Christ, because he's redeemed you and you're a new person, the old is gone, the new has come. This is what it looks like in, in, in the way you deal with people, especially be careful around those who are non-believers. Live wisely among those who are not believers. Again, making the most of every opportunity. Paul says, I've got these opportunities. I'm asking God to, to open up for me, but you also have these opportunities. Have you considered that this morning, church, that every day we have these opportunities? And you may have opportunities to touch or reach people that I will never even meet. And so our lives are like an open testimony of the, the goodness of God and, and how we live it is an opportunity for someone else on the outside looking at them saying, I don't know what, what it is about, about you, but I want what you got. And it's a perfect opportunity for us to share about our faith in, in Christ. Does that make sense? She says, live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. And then he says, let your conversation. I think some of the times our biggest problem is our mouth. You heard me and my big mouth, right? I heard someone years ago say, hey, come back tonight at church. Come back tonight, and I'm going to reveal the meanest member in the church. Everybody's like, ooh, I got an idea who that, that is. They show up to find out who the meanest member of the church is, and the preacher said, it's the tongue. The tongue is, is the meanest member in the body. Amen? 
It's unruly. He says, who could get control of that thing? Because, man, with it, we, we, we bless God and we curse people. It's like, you can get a hold of that thing, then you can control a lot of things. And so he says, when it comes to your conversation, church, believer in Christ, be gracious and attractive. Let that be gracious and attractive. We've received grace from God. He's like, let it funnel through you to other people. Show grace to other people. And he says, let it be attractive. The word there, it literally means salt. And salt enhances the flavor uh, of something. And so he says, let your speech be enhancing. It also preserves. So we speak a truth, but we are really careful how we do it. Amen? Amen? we got to be careful how we do it. So 1 Peter 3, 15, 16 says, If someone asks about the hope, your hope as a believer, always be ready to explain it. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. Keep your conscience clear. Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ Jesus. We belong to Christ. And because we belong to Christ, it's going to have an impact in our lives privately, in our preparation, prayer, like, you know what, I got so many things going on around me and to do today that I can't help but just start my, my time with some devoted prayer, speaking with the Father. And how cool is it that he gives us that invitation, church? So, so amazing. So I, I want to challenge you as, as, as I wrap this, this letter up, where Paul's heart is at, I think he hits on probably one of the most important things that we could grab a hold of. And that there's this lifeline, if you will, this vitality that's found in Christ by connecting to him in prayer. This, you know what prayer is? It's conversation. It's conversation. In fact, Rachel, come here a minute, please. Um, I'll give you a silly illustration, but this is kind of how we do. So if prayer is conversation, then that means there's conversation taking place. Grab that stool, baby. I, I something that pretty. I need to put you on a perch, baby. Here we go. We've been married for, she'll say too long, but a long time. But just imagine for a moment, I meet this young lady 30 plus years ago. Rachel, I, I think you're the best thing since sliced bread. I love you. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. You are awesome. And here's my plans for us. I think it'd be cool if we get married. We had a whole football team of kids. I did ask that one. But four kids, boys, girls, we'll, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to move us from one point to the other point. We're going to serve in ministry. We're going to do, we're going to, and I just love you. I just, you know, I'm devoted to you. I think you're awesome. And it would be cool if you would help, you know, you're a helpmate. So if you would help me achieve some of these things, right? I need your, but I need your help because you're my my, you're my, my helpmate. You're my partner, right? And, and so it's, it's nice having this conversation. It's been five minutes. And according to statistics, that's how long I'm supposed to be doing this. So um, we're done. So um, it was good talking with you. Like, Thanks. think about it. I'd, I'd love to hear back from you. I, that sounds, that's so dumb. That was so dumb. But watch this. Watch this. How many of us are guilty of the exact same thing in our prayer? God, I love you. Oh, let me tell you what I got going on, God. Let me tell you how I need your help. And God's like, but, 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 and we just keep talking. And we won't shut up. And so as you consider prayer a conversation, can I just challenge you this? Like, to commit yourselves to more of a prayer time. Like, and it may be different for you than it is for me. It may be early in the morning while you're awake. It may be later in the evening when you're fully focused. But carve out time. Devote time. Make an appointment with God, the Father, and say, I need to spend some time in communion with you. In conversation. Bring a chair. In fact, I just read a book this week called Chair Time, and it's the whole premise of that book is just sit in the chair. You're in the presence of God, the creator and the sustainer of the universe, the one who has all the wisdom and all the knowledge. Why are you talking? Amen? He's like, why would we just say, God, I really want to hear from you, and so I'm going to zip it. I'm just going to spend some time in your presence. I think it's one of those elements that we miss out on a lot. And then we walk around going, I wish God would speak to me. We don't give him time to speak to us. Amen? It, does it make sense? Silly illustration to drive home a point is like prayer is conversation. It's a two-way thing. So we, we present our request to him. And I'm not minimizing that. I think that we do that. He invites us to do it. But we also must acknowledge who it is that we're coming before. And that he's worthy of just me pumping the brakes for a moment. And, and he's worthy of our time. He's worthy of our full attention. So I leave the phone in another room. I leave the TV off, right? I mean, it's like he's worthy of that special time with me. And so set aside some time just to, to pray, so to connect, to find your vitality, 
in Christ Jesus. Develop an attitude of thanksgiving and prayer. If you struggle with that, just write a list of the things that are going right in your life. And everybody, no matter how bad it is, can find something that's going good in your life. Amen? Let me start with a list because I struggle sometimes. What's working for me? What's a win? And start writing those things down. And then as you pray, God, I wrote some things down because I want to make sure and tell you how much I appreciate you here. God, thank you for my wife. Thank you for my family. I thank you for the church. I thank you for Canyon where we live. I thank you for the opportunity that you've given me to be your hands and your feet. You could have totally chosen someone else, but you chose me, and so you get what you get, and here I am. But I'm thankful, God, that you've given me an opportunity. Does that make sense? Just to, over and over, just develop an attitude and a thanksgiving and prayer. Think about it. We as parents don't want our kids coming to us always asking. Sometimes it's nice to say, hey, Dad, I appreciate you. Thank you. Same thing in prayer. Pray for gospel opportunities. Keep your eyes open for opportunities. Don't just assume that they're going to happen inside the context of a church, but everywhere you go, you are the church, and there are people on the outside that need to hear the hope that we have in Christ. And so, God, what are you, what are you doing in me? Why are you got me here today? Why do you have me in this job? Why do you have me with this group of people? Whatever, pray that God will show you the opportunities uh, that he has for you, uh, that you might just let your light shine before them. Walk in wisdom toward others. Be really careful. Um, I had a friend a long time ago that said, protect your testimony. Shane, if there's anything you can do in ministry, just protect your testimony. Because many people have ruined their ministries because they let their guard down and they fell into some sin. He said, so protect your testimony. It's a very precious thing. It's important, right? So walk in wisdom toward outsiders. When they look at you and me, we don't even have to tell them that we're believers. They'll just see through our conduct that we belong to Christ. It's attractive, isn't it? I was like, man, I, I need some of that in my life. And so it's attractive to them. So let it be gracious and attractive or salty. Season your, your speech with grace and with salt. There's, I believe that we're closer today, and I mean, we say this as preachers, closer today than we've ever been before, before the return of Christ. And there's still many, many people who have not placed their faith and their hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the harvest is ripe, right? And the workers, well, that's us. It's not just me, the preacher, but... We are the body of Christ. And he's still working. He's not done. And he's not going to choose another alternate um, you know, method of reaching the world. It's the church. He says the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Right? And so this gospel message still carries great power. And so it is imperative for us to just understand that and say, God, I, I acknowledge that you're still doing work. And so I just want to, I want to plug into you. I, that's where the power is at. That's where my vitality and my strength is at. Let me trust you to guide me through this day. Let me have a thankful heart. Let me have a vigilant mind because these days are evil. I need to make the most of every opportunity. Show me my role. Show me my position at work and home with these particular people, at this particular random event. Like, why am I here, God? Do you have a plan and a purpose in that? Because you may be using me as a, a witness, a testimony to someone else that still doesn't know you yet. The question is, have you placed your faith in the gospel? Because the most important decision you and I can make is what we do with Jesus. The most important. But Christian, can I just be frank with us this morning? How are we doing when it comes to this idea of prayer in our lives? I think all of us would agree that there's room for improvement in our own lives. Amen? Not because it's just another thing that we have an obligation, but it's a privilege. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what pain we often forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear, all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Prayer is beautiful, and he's invited you and I to enjoy that journey with him. Isn't that awesome? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege that we have. Lord, we certainly don't feel like we're worthy. We certainly don't feel like we have anything to add to the conversation, but you've invited us into that conversation. You've invited us into your throne room, to pull up a chair with our name on it, Lord, and with everything else around us, just all the distractions by the wayside, the opportunity for us to connect, to commune, to con converse with the, the lover of our souls, the author, the finisher, and the protector of our faith. Thank you for that privilege and that opportunity. God, I pray that you just give us a fresh perspective this morning, knowing that there's a, there's a spiritual battle out there, there's a spiritual enemy that would love nothing more than to keep us from being connected to you. 
God, that we would just develop this mentality that uh, I have to have this time. I need this time. I can't do what I need to do without this time. And that we would be a people devoted to you in prayer. I'm reminded in history that every great move that you've moved in the world has is, is began with a few people on their knees petitioning you and praying. And God, my hope would be that there would be a great revival that would take place, not just in the world, but in Canyon, Texas. Lord, that it would come from uh, this church. And Lord, if you choose not to use this church, it would come in this community and we would see it and acknowledge it. But God, I, I want you to use us. But I want to be a prepared environment, a prepared vessel. And so God, would you just put a hunger and a thirst in us to connect to you with that vigilance and with that spirit attitude of gratitude. Father, knowing that the way we live our lives does matter. It's not just about our church life and then our other life. It's we're in you, and everywhere we go, we represent you. So everything that we do, everything that we say, we recognize as an opportunity for you to use us. So God, I pray that you would just be glorified in our lives as we leave this place today. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.